well? Excellent, great. So, well, we, we arrived to the last lecture uh, about alkaline atoms. Um, let me start by reminding you what, was the, uh, what we covered at the end of the lecture last time. So, um, what we, um, we, I mean, after having a discussion of the 1D lattice clock, then we went to the new realization of, of the experiment that has a 3D lattice clock where the experiment was able to prepare sites and select, the, uh, select sites with one, two, three, <laughs> and four, up to five atoms per site. And uh, the clock that was doing is a spectroscopy. Yes, so the basic idea in the experiment, they were able to select, so they prepare sites with one atom in the ground state, or two atoms in the ground state, so GG, or three atoms, four up to five. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, notice that uh, because we are talking about fermions, because we are dealing with uh, all the atoms in the lowest band, so the wave function in all the cases is fully symmetric. The wave function, the spatial wave function is just a product over the, um, over the Warner orbitals I was calling um, of for each particle. Mm -hmm. For each particle, this is my 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 wave function. Let me call it uh, five to r. So everything is symmetric. One, two. It's a product state. So wave function is spatially symmetric. Initially, all the atoms were in the ground state, and therefore, because of Pauli's Prussian principle, I need this state to be a, a, a singlet, a fully singlet state. In this case, uh, for GG, well, uh, for two atoms then uh, it's an SU2 singlet. Um, for three atoms, it's a fully anti-symmetric um, version of them. I mean, that's the simplest way to represent this state is the creation operator, the fermionic creation operator of, of spin one, spin two, and spin three uh, from the vacuum. So this state is fully anti-symmetric because I can I can anticipate, I mean, if I change any of the operators, I get a minus sign. So this is the initial state that I prepared with two, three, and four. And then I use a laser to excite the state from the ground to the excited state. Um, uh, the we, because, I mean, uh, one is half, one is zero, and we have three P zero. And then the pulse is like, I go from the state that has G, G, up to a state, for example, that have just a single excitation. To remember, two excitations are lossy, are forbidden, so I want to probe the spectrum from the ground state to the excited state, yes? So what we were seeing yesterday, uh, at the end of the class, was trying to look at the spectrum of atoms that has a certain symmetry, that uh, because of the symmetry, uh, there is only one, um, uh, well, this is the ground state. The energy of the ground state only depends on the ground-ground scattering length. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, so yes, this UGG was proportional, therefore, to the scattering length GG times the integral of the Warnier function to the 3R. So this is this is the wave function over that. That's the is proportional to this. So. UEG is the same thing plus, but the proportional to AEG plus, the same integral, and UEG minus proportional to EG minus the same type of integral. I mean, that's that's what we're that's the idea of the of the um, of the I mean uh, I mean basically we are saying we start we have a field operator and we uh, of particle in spin sigma and stage G, and we were expanding the field operator in terms of uh, creation operators. We are saying the, the, the atoms are only going to be in the lowest band, so we are going to expand. This operator is just at the creation um, operator, or, or C maybe. C operator, that is sigma uh, G, for example, uh, at a, um, at a, well, maybe we can put a, a lattice site here at site E. So a lattice site E, and this is going to be associated with the Warner orbital localized at this site and only the zero one. Mm -hmm. So this is 
This is n equal to zero to simplify. So I just have particles in the lowest band, and I have um, the, this is the interaction energy that we were measuring. Mm -hmm. Is that clear for everybody? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, so we have the energy of the all the particles in the ground state needs to have an S U N singlet. Uh, n is the number of particles in the state, and then we have only two different energies thanks to the SUN behavior, the SUN symmetry of the state. I have the state that is fully, I mean, one of the states is when I have fully symmetric E and G orbitals. Remember that here the convention, I change a little bit for simplicity. Up is excited state, down, down is ground state. So the first state is the fully symmetrized a state when I have all atoms in the ground state and one excited state, and therefore this state has energy that is proportional to UEG plus n minus one because it's the number of of a, a number of pairs that I can create between one, uh, up and down, and then the number of atoms there are. So if I have a pair of UEG, then I and I have n atoms, then I have the remaining n minus one atoms are going to interact via GG interactions. Mm -hmm. And then the energy of the other states that are not fully symmetric because I cannot fully symmetrize completely if I have one excited state. But is, uh, is, is this state has, um, well, uh, you can see all spins, all the atoms in the ground state. And then I have some anti symmetrization between, um, I mean, th there are n minus one reminder states when I can symmetrize, anti symmetrize these two or these two up to when I move to the beginning. So the idea is that I have only three energies that characterize the spectrum, and actually that's exactly what they were seeing in the in the clock. That when they were doing the spectroscopic between um, the ground and the excited state, this first peak when I have one atom per side is kind of the zero point reference, and then they were seeing that when they have sides with two atoms, they were only two peaks. Remember, they are measuring the energy difference between the excited state and the ground state. So the only two energies that they were going to measure is the energy difference between this and this. This is one, and the energy difference between this and this. This is the other. Only two peaks for n no matter how many atoms I have in my, in my state. That's the beauty of the SUN symmetry. So that's what they were seeing, uh, one peak. For two atoms, they see two peaks. For they have three atoms, three pe uh, two peaks. Always two peaks, the, the minus and the plus terms that they were re related with UEG plus and the, and the other that was associated with, well, a combination of UE plus and UE minus. Um, all right. So that were the spectrum that the experiment saw. Um, very small uh, three body losses uh, uh, observed. Um, and the question is that we wanted to try to understand what was going on. For two atoms, uh, uh, what uh, we discussed last time is that, I mean, uh, the Guarnier orbital changes as a function of lattice depth. So what I am going to do is that uh, I, they are going to have, I mean, the proportionality constant. I mean, we can compute this. The com and when we com where compute uh, the ground, uh, I mean, if we, if we compute the slope, it will allow us to compute what is Eg plus and Eg minus. And this is exactly what they, what, uh, what it was computed versus lattice depth, so we can determine what is this gx, and with that we can determine the scattering length, and we were able to determine the eg plus and eg minus scattering lengths that I mentioned that they were agreeing with what we were measuring before in the one lattice clock. That is was a much more complicated system, so that that was great. So, but the next step that we wanted to discuss is the fact that uh, when they were measuring uh, with the clock they were seeing that, unfortunately, when the well, we are going to see atoms with three, four, and, and five, they were deviations from what we expect from just the simple two-body interactions. Yes, so uh, in principle, uh, when we write the interaction Hamiltonian between uh, many particles, we wrote the Hover model that has the different terms that was the, um, uh, well, we can, we can go back to these terms. Um, sorry. When, when we grow the interaction energy for two particles, and we had the Hover model um, here, 
that has, well, the tunneling completely cancels because we have very localized atoms in the lattice, but the interaction part, when you have a um, two particle, uh, well, uh, we'll have uh, in, uh, many particles, uh, n particles in a given lattice site, we have the direct terms that, uh, or, or the, I mean, the intra-interaction terms between GG and EE that has this form that just count the number of atoms, n, n is the number of atoms in a given lattice site. Then we have the direct and we have the exchange there. This is from assuming that you just have two body uh, interactions. I, is that clear for everybody? Yes, so using this Hamiltonian, in principle, if we know the scattering lengths, because of these parameters depends on the, on, the, on the scattering lengths, or u e g plus and u e g minus, we compute exactly what were the energies. And this what was what showing a deviation with respect to what they observed in the experiment. So something was happening in the, in, in the system, mm -hmm. or that it was not um, just fully accounted for um, for the simple uh, hover model descriptions of the dynamics. Okay, so we try to understand then what is going on, and then uh, la that's where we finished yesterday, um, that we mentioned that, well, uh, in prior experiments in the, in the blocks group, they were seen that actually not all the times, the, in this case was the Bose hover model was agreeing with what they were seeing, because if they were uh, the Bosch-Hoar model that has energies, I mean, this is the case of bosons, the same flavor. So if you have a term of the form n, n minus 1, this is the interaction energy between n particles in a given lattice site, because n is an integer value, when the, the experiments that they did is that they prepare a coherent state in a single, in the single well, because they have a, a bose einstein condensate. So in a single well, they have a superposition of states with different number of particles with some weight that is associated with the CCN that is was associated with the Poissonian distribution of the state. I mean, here is the, is the characteristic by form of the CN coefficient. Alpha is associated with the mean number of particles. But the important point here is that, well, there was a superposition of states with different particle number, and the energy is U times an integer value. Yes, if you have two particles, it's U. If you have um, three particles, it's going to be three u. I mean, you can see. So everything is an integer, and therefore, because the energy, in the energy at, at multiple times of, of if, if we from this spectrum, we can compute, for example, what is the expectation value of the A operator, the creation, the annihilation operator, and it was going to be a, an oscillatory function times u times t, and that means that at integer, when u t is multiple of two pi then we will have perfect coherence and revivals, and this is not what, what they observe in the experiment. So there were other cases where they, there was deviation of the simple two-body Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to understand and borrow the techniques that they compute here. In this paper, they attribute the fact that, that the idea of the Hoval model, where you assume that you have just the Warner function I mean, I, I, oh, today, I mean, with the optical lattice, you already saw the, the Warner functions. These are localized states at a given lattice site, are single particle states. So the fact that the Warner function is not a, a enough to compute a, the interaction energy, but maybe we need to modify this single particle function when you have more particles, that was the key. That, that's the intuition. Mm -hmm. So let's try to understand a little bit um, what is happening. Similar, I mean, the idea is similar here with a little bit more of complexity because in the bosonic experiment, they have particles in the same internal level, internal state. In this case, the difference is that, well, not only we have two, three, four particles, but moreover, we have particles with different nuclear spin states, and one is in the ground state, and we have one particle in the excited state. Yes, so, so it's a little bit richer, the Hamiltonian. But what is, what is going on, and, and what is the intuition? Um, OK, so um, as I said, we assume I if you have a single lattice site, and you have some particles here mm -hmm, in this site, the calculation that we were doing, do, uh, I mean the hover model, or the calculations that we were doing before, is assume that the field operator or is going to um, be expanded in terms of single particle uh, wave functions. 
corresponding to the lowest band. And the idea is that if you have a very deep lattice, this is the n equal to zero state. And the first excited state is, um, is very far away. There is an interaction energy, um, a single particle energy, h bar omega, when omega is the, is the frequency of the trap. And this omega can be very large for deep lattices, can be larger than, I mean, it can be larger for the lattice that we we're considering. Omega must be larger than uh, 20 uh, kilohertz, for example, very large. Whereas the interaction energies that we were considering, if we go the back, is of the order of the order of kilohertz. So this band gap, uh, the idea, I mean, is that this band gap is very large. So you can prepare the particles in the lowest band. And for example, when they do, if people do time of flight, they see the particles in the, in the lowest band. So there is no population in this higher band because this is far, far from, I mean, it's of resonance. But the idea here is that even though it's of resonance, still these states can be virtually populated. Virtually populated is that if you do second order perturbation theory, then one particle, even in the presence of interactions, what happens is that, um, for example, the interaction term of the Hamiltonian, when we were writing, for example, is, uh, let, I'm going to write uh, for the bosonic case just for, simplify, for, for simplicity. This is the interaction term of the Hamiltonian, yes? We are assuming the pseudo potential, so this is the, the interaction term. These are field operators. And the idea that we do is that, OK, uh, for in getting the, the hover model, we write the field operator as sum over the particles, the creation operator, or particles in band n with the wave function n at x. This is the operator. Um, this is the expansion of the field operator uh, in terms of uh, different bands in the lattice. Yes? And, and the idea when we, when we derive uh, the hover model is we are saying, as I said here, well, everything is in the lowest band. So when we plug this quantity here, we have an interaction Hamiltonian that is going to be proportional to this integral of Warnier function to the fourth, d3x. But then we have the operator that is c0 daga, c0 daga, cc. Yes, that's, and if you reorder this term, you are, going, you are going to get something, this term is proportional, I mean, well, this is proportional to the scattering length here. We have the interaction term has the scattering length, A. Then this term is going to be something proportional to the scattering length, the, the Guarnier, this integral over the Guarnier function to the four, and then n, zero, and zero minus one. Uh, well, um, always have a factor of two divide, divided by two. That's how we obtain the, 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 this, this hover model, that assuming everything's in the lowest band. But the truth is that when you plug this operator into this in integral of, of that has a field operator, you don't get necessarily only terms that are in the lowest band, yes? When you do the full expansion, what we get are terms, the interaction Hamiltonian, is proportional to terms that are, um, it's, well, it's going to be uh, a sum over n l m p of c n daga, c p daga, c n, c, uh, c l, c m. So we are summing over all the different bands. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that we are uh, saying energetically, because the particle, there is a very large back gap, a band gap, then we are only populating the lowest band and we replace all of these by zero. But the truth is that in general, these all indexes can be dif different. And to first order in perturbation theory, if you, you um, so what you do is, I mean, the, the, the lowest, the hover model is when you project this interaction part that has sum over all these different bands into the lowest band. Mm -hmm. So this is the, 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 what, what we computed, and that's what gave, gave us the, the, the Hover model. But you can do second order perturbation theory when you have the projection into the lowest band, but you have your interaction Hamiltonian, 
and then you can sum over all the possible intermediate states, mm -hmm. then, uh, and then apply the also the interaction term, and then go back and then divide it by the energy difference. Yes, this is second order perturbation theory. So when you do second order perturbation theory, you can see that there are terms, for example, that when you have all particles in the, in the ground band, then you can make one of the particles jump into the first band, and then this costs too much energy because, of course, higher bands are very energetically costly, and then the particles have to go back. So this is a second order perturbation theory. In other ways, these excited states are just virtually populated. Yeah? And if we do it this, for example, I have this Hamiltonian. You can see that, for example, the lowest energy term that I can get is I have my particle in the lowest band. So if I, um, my state leaves, when I apply this state, this state leaves with all particles in n equal to 0. So to lowest order, I, can, I have to destroy a particle in 0 destroy the particle in zero, then I can create in zero, but I can create in a higher band. Yes? This intermediate state, then, is a state that has one particle in this higher band, for example, this state here. Mm -hmm. And then if I apply a gate the Hamiltonian, I mean, this is intermediate state, then I can have another application of the Hamiltonian where I still, I can destroy this particle in the higher band, I apply, so this, this annihilates back the particle in the higher band, and then I can do, yes? So then at the end, I created a particle in a higher band, I destroyed the particle in that band, so at the, the final state leaves again with all atoms in zero, that's allowed. And I'm going to divide by, uh, by the energy, uh, so this is the, the energy of the um, I mean, the energy of this, I mean, is the energy difference between this state and the energy state is n, n zero, this the, because there is one extra, I mean, there is a minus sign here, but there is one, uh, there is the energy of the particle that is excited in the band. Mm -hmm. So this, if you look at this, then when you write the Hamiltonian, because, I mean, this creates, this, this process creates an annihilates a particle, at the end we have a term that has three body interactions in it, because I have six creation operators, so I can rearrange it up to, and then I can have a term that has n, n, n zero, three body interactions in my system. So that's the root of higher order, so higher order interactions can effectively emerge by promoting the part, by considering the virtual processes of particles in the higher band. Is that clear? So uh, that's the process that one of my students, um, the calculation that one of my students did, that is quite messy. I mean, you have to sum over all intermediate states, yes? So could you repeat what you just said? So you say that the, the promotion of one of the particles to the higher band is mediated by three body processes, or is no, it? No, uh, I mean, the interaction is always two body. So this Hamiltonian that is I'm writing here comes from two body interactions. These are phi daga, phi daga. Five, five. Yes, this is always two body processes. And expanding these two body processes into, I mean, I, I, I write in the field operator where I write. This field operator can always be expanded as Cn omega n. Yes, this, this always I'm expanding. So I'm expanding this here. Hmm? And then what you can see is that it, when you restrict the part, the, this Hamiltonian to just the project only on the lowest band, then, well, you get a two-body interaction. But because they can be virtual processes that excite one particle in a higher band and then come back, then m multiple application of this Hamiltonian can effectively generate a multi-body process, a multi-interaction. So for example, the lowest order gives you a three-body. The way that you can interpret this, another way to interpret it is that when you have, if you have the, I mean, imagine that you have the wave function that is the eigenstate of this lowest state. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that this is a single particle of Hamilton, a eigenfunction. If I put two atoms, mm -hmm. this wave function is going to be broader because the repulsion is going to push the particles apart. Mm -hmm. 
So this was the lowest, uh, um, the, this was the single particle state, but the many particle state is going to be a little bit broader, yes? Well, a little bit broader depending how much repulsion. For example, if you solve the GPA equation, you see that you have a Thomas Fermi profile when you have many bosons in, the, in, in a trap. So a broader wave function means that it has an admixture of higher bands, yes? So if, if, I mean, the, this wave function phi of the interacting particle, the effective orbital, uh, the effective orbital that you can see is going to be a, a superposition of the part, the lowest band plus some contribution from higher bands, one plus and so forth. So this is the way that we are including that in, 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 my, in, my, in, in this perturbative process. I'm writing here in terms of operators. I mean, so this is second quantization, this is first quantization, kind of. But the idea is that effectively, the fact that I'm not having all my particles in the lowest band, if, if I want to project my Hamiltonian to stick on the lowest band, it's not enough to write only two body interactions. But the effect of populating the higher bands, when I project my Hamiltonian, I restrict the particles to be in the lowest band is just uh, it gives, or gives us a result the emergence of multi-body interactions. They are suppressed because you can see that the, all this, in, this intermediate state when you do perturbation theory is always divided by the energy cost. Mm -hmm. So when you go, the lowest band is divided by E, the uh, or h bar omega, it's second band, 2h bar omega, and, and you have to, in principle, sum over all possible bands and up to the continuum because, I mean, in principle, all these processes are, are, are allowed. And that's not that easy. So, to, um, of course, at some point you truncate, but that's the effective theory that, field theory that you can generate by uh, when you project your dynamics only to the lowest band. Hmm? And that's what we have done. So, in principle, we did apply second order perturbation theory that is just projecting, you have during, this is the projector on the lowest band, then you apply the interaction Hamiltonian, then this I is, is kind of goes to higher states that are not in the lowest band, divided by the energy cost, and then you just project back. Mm -hmm. This is the second term. If you want to go to higher order, then it's a little bit even more trickier because you have to have multiple application of these processes. You go to the ground band, the Hamiltonian, and you have the intermediate states once, the Hamiltonian intermediate states too, and, and so forth. And there even, I mean, if you try to do the actual perturbation theory, you have not only this term, but you have an additional terms that you have to account. So, but I mean, what I just want to, do, to get is the idea that uh, by including virtual processes to higher states, we can cons convert this simple two-body Hamiltonian into a multi-body process. And well, uh, for example, in this case, this is an example when you go, you have your initial state, you, the interactions promote one particle here into the higher band. Um, oh, sorry, uh, the, you, have, you have the particle, you have promoting here your particles into the higher band, but then you can switch, uh, you can have other processes that actually act within this band and switch the particles and come back. So this is high order, like Feynman diagrams. You are going to solve all these possible intermediate processes. And in fact, um, that's what my student did. He took a, a, a kind of a diagrammatic expansion of all the terms and tried to compute what is the effective Hamiltonian after you sum over all these intermediate states. Mm -hmm. And what he finds is very nice, very simple at the end. So the, to, to lowest order, we go back to the Hamiltonian that I write at the beginning. So you have just the um, interaction between ground ground, the direct term, and the, and the exchange term that we saw last time. But as a, function, as a result of the perturbation, now you start to have three body terms. So you can see NG, NG, NG. And I mean, of course, uh, because they are fermions, you have to have different nuclear spin state. Uh, populating, uh, acting, I mean, this, this product has to have, this operator has to have different nuclear spin state. This is, this is the correction to this term. The correction of this term is that you add an additional, so you have these two terms, and you add an additional NG operator. Mm -hmm. And for these terms, exactly the same, you keep the same one, but you add and then an additional NG. This is the, 
it's very, I mean, it's amazing that at some point this resumation ends up some such simple Hamiltonian. And you can go to four order terms and you can get that you have four body operators and then you just add products of NG, NG in, o, in all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if the second order perturbation theory um, converges because principally that is some order one over N. Yes, exactly. Uh, so it, it does converge. It does converge in this case, but it's tricky because you have to regularize it. it okay. You do have to, it's a little bit complicated. And the regularization comes because even the two particles, the two body interactions, you have to do that. Do, I mean, after you subtract the regularization that you do for two, bo two particles, then it converges. But yes, it's, I mean, it's, it, you have to regularize it. Um, so, but when you regularize it, at the end, you have this very nice uh, Hamiltonian where these terms, can be computed analytically and are, are integral as a summation over higher bands, um, all of these terms. But I mean, they are deterministic. I mean, you, you get an expression for them, you put it in the computer, and you sum over all of them. Um, and at the end, uh, therefore, there is not a fitting parameter. I mean, if you know the lattice depth, you know the band structure, you can compute all these terms here. And then you can, uh, if you know the scattering length, then what uh, he did is, um, without any extra fitting parameters, he started to compare. This is the, as a function of, of the detuning of the laser. Of, of, I mean, depending on the detuning, you excite two or three or four or five. So for example, um, this is the case um, uh, when you have um, the dashed lines are the theory just based on two body interactions, and the solid lines is where you include these multi-body interactions. And what he needed is to include terms up to four body interactions in order to converge to the experimental results. But remarkable, uh, we were able to reproduce the measurements of the clock with very well. Maybe five is not that bad, that, but at, uh, for five particles, you start to have a little bit or uh, <laughs> systematic in the experiments because there are very few uh, sites with five particles. So maybe the five is the one that fit less accurate. But, um, but, but, but we, are we, we are able to reproduce it. Now, <laughs> someone asked me the question, what are the plus state deviating more from the, min from the minus state? And this is comes because of the different uh, scattering lengths. I mean, everything at some point depends on the uh, ground scattering length and and um, uh, um, they are different so uh, here so the ag plus has a larger a little bit larger scattering length than the ag minus so give you a little bit higher corrections to the theory because you have more bands populated in some degree so the effect of the perput version theory need it was higher for the plus than for the minus mm -hmm. so just, uh, two questions actually so one is for so when you have the two minus and two Mm -hmm. They get also somewhat renormalized by this effect, right? Because the, the two particles. Right. Yes, but this is, we measure it from the experiment. Because the experiment gives us, I mean, that's what you, t yes. But you also have to kind of change the value function because of interaction. Yes, exactly. We did change, but we take it for granted from the experiment. I mean, in this field theory okay. calculation, you have to subtract the two particle calculation. So the two particle energy, that's what you do for regularizing. And this is getting from the experiment. OK, and then second question is, you could imagine also doing some variation in theory, like take the value function and kind of Yes. So yes, we didn't that's do it. We didn't do it, but this is another approach in principle. That, no, my, my question is, I guess to first order, well, to second order is probably giving you the same result. But is it going to give you the same result if you go to higher order? I think you have to try to um, compute what is the what is the broadening of your of your variational. I mean, if you try to compute, um, for example, for you have to compute also the change of shape. Exactly, 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 exactly. So it is. It is. This is systematic, and we just compute things uh, without. I mean. I mean, he had to do to resume all the diagrams and then regularize them. So it was not trivial. I mean, I have to admit that it was one of the most complicated, more calculate complicated calculations that I have given to a student. But he was able to do it. I mean, without re regular. Um, we were following the the paper that uh, of Emmanuel, 
where they do all the regularization. So basically, we were taking the same tricks that you regularize your theory or you put a cut off. And then uh, everything kind of flow uh, from those calculations systematically. But I mean, the intuition is yes, the intuition is that if you compute a, a, a you try to do some variational theory that you can compute what is the broadening of your Warner function, you can still use two body calculations but with a different, I mean, instead of using the Warner orbital, the integral over the single particle Warner orbital, you should compute a many body orbital that depends on the number of particles. But to second order, you just have the broadening, I guess. The, the, uh, yes, the second order, however, the broadening, I mean, there are two things. There are also, I mean, uh, the scattering length is also slightly regulated, modified because of the lat, I mean, this scattering length that, that we, that, is, is the scattering length in the in the in free space, but when you have the, the scattering length in the lattice is modified because of of the um, I mean you ha you have to I mean when you even when you have two particles in a lattice the interaction between two particles in a lattice is going to depend on the potential, so that's why for each I mean that mm -hmm. yeah so um, uh, uh, I mean what we to confirm it is that the clock is surprisingly accurate that we were able to reproduce all these corrections from from higher bands uh, in, in, in and, and th that was um, showing that well yes I mean in principle we can really see many body physics in the clock even though I mean here are simple systems of two atoms three atoms per lattice height but uh, still the few body corrections uh, were uh, were captured or were um, spectroscopically resolved by the clock. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's the, that's, that was one of the very nice uh, messages uh, that we got from these, from these measurements. Okay, so uh, l I'm going to go from now, I mean, we have determined very well the scattering lengths. We have seen that the clock can measure um, uh, even many body behavior in the trivial, trivial case that we can imagine, that is when atoms are isolated in a given lattice site. But of course, the physics is richer. And I mean, we are very exciting, excited about what we can actually see in this type of models where we have um, not only a, um, where we have a atoms moving in a lattice um, with a SUN degrees of freedom. So, we know the Hover model, even for two flavors, the phase diagram is not known. So what happens when we are writing a Hover model with SUN, uh, with N different flavors? It can be really, really rich and um, provide uh, as resource for quantum simulation that is remarkable. So uh, what we have here in this slide, what I'm just trying to emphasize is different type of of models that in principle could give rise to amazing or very exciting um, a simulation of condensed matter uh, systems. And I'm just going to mention these three and I give you a reason why this can be very exciting. So if you have a just, um, if you are deep in the, in, in a deep lattice regime, when you have uh, you want what we call, you have just what is called a mod insulator, when you have basically one particle per side. Mm -hmm. Then um, if you have a system with SU2, mm -hmm. um, then uh, the physics that governs the, the spin uh, ordering in the system is what is called super exchange interactions. Mm -hmm. And the super exchange interactions is just the process where, for example, I have one particle, I'm going to again advocate pertur uh, perturbation theory. If I have particle up and down, mm -hmm, then uh, if, if the tunneling is very large, is very small, so I have some tunneling between these two sides. If the tunneling is very small and the interaction energy is much larger than the tunneling, then what happens is that uh, to lowest order, my Warner functions are very localized at the given lattice site and the system is just one particle per site. Mm -hmm. Now, but in order to determine the, the or spin ordering, what happens is that where to lowest order, if this doesn't talk to this, then it, I can orient in any spin 
I can have any spin orientation. But on the other hand, to if I do virtual uh, second order perturbation theory, what happens is that this particle can come tunnel here and go back, yes? And therefore, the lowest energy um, Hamiltonian is going to be proportional to J squared divided by U because the particle comes. So it's an application of the tunnel. The, the tun I mean, this is the state with one particle per side. So it's, it's really one one. Apply the, the tunnel in Hamiltonian. Uh, then I have an intermediate state that can have many different two particles. And then I apply the Hamiltonian and project back into the state one one divided by the energy cost of having one particle uh, when, I mean, when they hop. Um, the important point is that you can see if I have a triplet, any triplet cannot hop because Pauli exclusion principle prevents me to have two particles in the same lattice site. So the only particle that can hop is the singlet. So only the singlet is the going to be the one that lowers the energy, yes? So the Hamiltonian, therefore, is going to have, and in the, if you see the singlet state, you can see that uh, this state can go lo um, lower the energy. So in principle, my Hamiltonian is going to be something like a, um, a minus one quarter. Mm -hmm. So you can see that when I am a triplet, I cannot hop this term. When I am a triplet, this term is one quarter, so it's zero. But, and this is one and two. But when I am a singlet, this is minus three quarters, I lower my energy. And that's why it is, is j squared. I mean, it, I get minus j squared over u. Mm -hmm. So the, the Hamiltonian that rules the behavior of the low energy sector of SU2 system is what is called a, a Heisenberg model. When I want to favor antiferromagnetic formation, the singlet is, is an stagger antiferromagnetic formation. So what happens um, when we have go from SU2 to SUN? The question is what type of Hamiltonian is going to rule my, 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 my system? So we, we saw uh, before that, I mean, the analog, the analog of, of S dot S uh, for the SUN system is something like is the operator uh, MN, MN. This is particle at side I. This is at phi I plus one. I mean. I mean, this is just a constant. So it's, it's also j squared over u, but the Hamiltonian is going to sum over different flavors. Mm -hmm. So they, in principle, what they want to favor is kind of as S SUN singlets. Mm -hmm. And um, so this, uh, this is for SU2, the Heisenberg model. But for, for, um, for larger n, what we have is kind of the analog of, of SUN Heisenberg models. It's a generalization from the SU2 to SUN. And, and something very exciting that what we find is that um, there is a parameter regime in principle where the Hamiltonian can form what is called a, a chiral spin liquid. So uh, here you can see in SU2, if you lower the temperature, you try to form and you favor an antiferromagnetic state. What we were finding for some numerical calcul uh, from some calculations for the SUN Hamiltonian is that um, Depends, depending on the number of particles that you have per site, you can form from what is called balanced bond solids. For example, if I have um, SUN, uh, N, particle, uh, N flavors, if I have N half particles here and N half particles here, I can form between these two an SUN singlet because I have all the flavors in these two sides. Mm -hmm. So the, the, I mean, the, just I can uh, isolate my system so forming kind of um, only states uh, in blocks of two uh, that is called balanced bond solids. But as I go for one particle per site, we, f we find that um, in principle we can get a chiral spin liquid that is kind of a topological state that is the analog of the quantum hole, fractional quantum hole state, but in a spin degree of freedom. So just, I don't want to enter in details, just to mention that there is very exciting possibilities to find exotic states of matter when you go from SU2 to SUN. Mm -hmm. This is one, 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 one application when you are deep in the mode regime. The other very interesting uh, Hamiltonian um, quantum simulation that we can generate for SUN systems is what is called the condo lattice model. And 
uh, in Emmanuel's blog group, there they were trying to actually um, um, trying to engineer this type of this type of quantum simulation uh, in our system. So I'm going to briefly, briefly, briefly mention the how we are trying to engineer the condolatis model in these systems. And well, there are other. I mean, there are other type of here. Uh, I am all using ground state atoms, but in principle, an analog of of this type of multi insulator systems that uh, that not only have ground but also excited atoms can can happen in that people call Kuhel Komsky models. Uh, in um, in this case, I just have a nuclear spins of the ground state. Here I can have. Nucle a nuclear spin, but also two orbitals, the ground and the excited state. So these are Hamiltonians that happens in transition metal oxides that you can have an orbital degrees of freedom that in principle we, want, we can emulate. So just a few words about implementation of condolatins model and heavy fermions in these systems. Um, so the condolatins model uh, is a model of, of magnetism that explains the behavior of heavy fermium materials. Um, and the idea of this Hamiltonian is actually quite simple. The idea is that uh, they have an, uh, a set of magnetic moments, F, that are localized in the lattice. They are kind of magnetic impurities. And then on top of them, there are a set of uh, conduction electrons that are mobile in the same lattice. So I have two types of atoms. The F that are, I mean, because I'm um, <laughs> adopting the, the terminology in condensed matter because there are kind of um, um, magnetic moments in F orbitals that cannot move. They're just spin defects that are in a given lattice site. And then they're interacting with a bath of conduction electrons that they can move. This is the idea of the condo lattice mode. So the Hamiltonian is quite simple. I have, these are fermionic operators, and this is determined the tunneling of, of my particles, a sigma, for example, this is a spin one half, just to give an idea. There are a spin up or down, and I have my particles tunneling in the, 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 the conduction electrons can tunnel. And what happens is that the conduction electrons, however, interact locally with the um, localized magnetic moments through an S dot S interactions for the ca case of SU2. So this uh, Hamiltonian, depends on the sign of this coupling constant. If it is positive, it favors singlet formation. If it is negative, you favor ferromagnetic um, alignment between these two. Actually, when it's positive, that you favor singlet formation, uh, in condensed matter, they refer to a, a condo model, condo lattice model. When it's negative, they call it double exchange. Um, because, um, but yeah. So the point here is that this model admits a very complex phase diagram, uh -huh, um, depending on the ratio between the exchange and the tunnel. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and well, they, they grade it in, in terms of temperature. And then there is a regime when they say that there is a magnetic order, order and I have to admit there are KKY interactions. I'm going to explain briefly. And then there is another region when they form heavy, heavy fermion uh, materials. Um, and there is a region when you have exotic superconductivity. So the interesting part is that we think that with alkaline atoms, we not only should be able to implement this uh, SU2 uh, condo lattice model, but a generalization of this model that has SUN flavors. And the interesting part is many of these phase diagrams that were computed analytic, uh, well, theoretically, not analytical, but theoretically, actually use n large n expansions to compute them. So this is not an idealization anymore, but actually when you have an SUN system, we can have a large n expansion and maybe we can see easier these phases. So very briefly, how we are going to implement the condolatis model, and very briefly, I'm going to tell you the, what is the essence of the physics. So the idea is that in, if we have the ground, and the excited states, the two, or the two clock states that are very stable. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that um, I told you that for the clock, we were using a, what is called the magic lattice. So a lattice where the uh, a wavelength, where the polarizability of the ground and the excited state 
is exactly the same. However, we have been able to, um, to show that for these atoms, there is another case of, 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 of other conditions where you can show that at some wavelength, the polarizability for the ground state um, is finite, but is zero for the excited state, and vice versa. So you can generate a lattice, for example, that is very, very deep for the excited state, and um, a lattice that, uh, that is diff the, a very different lattice there for the ground state. And in principle, you can adjust the wavelength to make them commensurate by applying uh, the laser beams at a given orientation. So if you angle the beams, you can modify the spacing of the lattice. So the idea, in principle, is that we can generate a, a very deep lattice for the excited state. And when they and we can trap them one atom per side, so they form a very. They are going to make the role of the F electrons that are very localized. An additional, I can generate a shallow lattice for the for the uh, G, G particles. So this will act at the role of the of the conduction electrons. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, in principle, the number of flavors can be controlled by by state preparation. And um, in principle, uh, uh, the exchange. Remember that when we write the Hamiltonian, uh, the Hover mo the Hover model, we have uh, the direct and the exchange term. The exchange term is the S dot S Hamiltonian. Uh, that um, that is exactly what we have in the in the condolatis model. And uh, uh, so the direct term. Remember that the, there are two terms in the Hamiltonian. You were having the the exchange the direct term that is N G, N E and the exchange term that were exactly these flip-flop terms. So you have um, an atom in, in the excited state, in the excited state, M, M prime one, and then you have in the ground state, M prime, N, G, M. So you can see that this, for SU2, for example, this can be a term that is down, up, and this is up, down. So this term is just um, S minus S plus. Pl I mean, you can see that these are the one of the terms is S minus S plus. So this is the exchange Hamiltonian that we need for the condolatis mode. So this natural, this exchange thing, uh, remember that uh, we, I told, we, we talk about the experiment in the Malmort block that they were, they used to measure the flip flops uh, and this exchange interaction. So this is exactly the term for the condolatis model. But moreover, if we change, um, we can change the, um, uh, the, um, we can displace the lattice for the ground and the excited state. And in principle, we can change the wave function overlap and we can tune the, the magnitude of the exchange interaction. So we have S dot S that is tunable. Um, so um, yes, so in principle, we can engineer the condo lattice model in, in this system. So very quickly, um, very, very quickly, um, what is the physics that we can see in the condolatis model and why it can be very interesting. So if you look at the, um, we have a band of, of localized particles here. The, the Hamiltonian consists of um, a band of mobile particles and then localized electrons, yes? So if you look at the energy, just before ignoring these, these coupling terms, this before ignoring this term, I have a band that is very flat because the, the F particles don't tunnel, so the energy is almost constant in the lattice. And I have a band uh, for the mobile particles I have a cosinusoidal dispersion relation. So this is energy respect to quasi momentum. Mm -hmm. And the particles in the lowest band has a, a cosinusoidal dispersion, yes, kind of a cosine term. Mm -hmm. So this is the energy of the versus momentum. This is proportional to um, this dispersion relation is minus 2j cos Ka. K is the quasi momentum. And for the F electrons, this is just um, flat. Mm -hmm. So what this term does is kind of mix or hybridize the bands, yes? So it, 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 it couples them. So what happens if you write what is the couple Hamiltonian when this term enters, you are going to have something that is 
I mean, I'm going to follow this state, and then uh, there is an uh, instead of having this crossing, I go, I go, I get an adiabatic crossing, avoided crossing here between these two. So the bands goes like this, goes like this. This is for the one case, and then we have this other band that it goes like this and like this. Yes. So this is the lowest energy state. The blue is the lowest energy state. And then I'm going to put my particles in the system. I'm going to fill these bands. And then what happens is that I start to fill in this band, as usual here. But then, because I cannot, and the lowest energy state, instead of going up, is going to I continue filling my, my band here, fill, filling my fire here. Mm -hmm. And you can see that for the appropriate feeling, you are always going to have your Fermi energy in the part when the band is flat. And because the flatted or flatness of the band is associated with the motion, with the kinetic energy of the particles, if it's very flat, it means that the particles are extremely heavy. Yes, it's, it's flat, so it, remember that the tunneling is proportional kind of the inverse of the mass. Mm -hmm. And this part, I mean, it's almost flat, so this effective tunneling in this, in this flat region is almost zero. And this is the origin of the he heavy fermions. That's why when you have a dishybridization between these two types of states, you can form what is called a heavy Fermi liquid that can have masses 1,000 times more than the just bare uh, fermions that were not interacting. So this is one of the physics that, in principle, we can try to explore. And actually, this type of hybridization and try to Fermi liquid behavior can be, can be reached at lower temperature when you go from SU2 to SUN. So that's one of the exciting pro prospects. Something came um, that didn't work very well is that, for, um, for example, in the experiment for Emmanuel, that he was working with Ethereum 173, that is SPIN SU6. Mm -hmm. Remember that they, they found this orbital fetchback resonance. And unfortunately, the, the lowest energy state is not the singlet, but the triplet. And in this case, this physics is, is different. So that's, that's the caveat. But it um, seems that the groups in, um, in Takahashi's group, they have measured the interview 171. And maybe in this case, the lowest energy state is the spin, uh, nuclear spin singlet. So in principle, it's possible to actually implement and see the physics of the, <coughs> of the condolatism model in this system. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, you Well, <laughs> not necessary. This is not, but well, this is a Fermi liquid behavior. It's, okay. I mean, it's heavy quasi particles. Um, um, there are cases, for the case of the condo insulator, you fill all of this so it becomes a complete insulator. So everything is filled up to this. That is the condo, it, it, this is when you have the, the condo insulator. And in this case, um, uh, there is, um, because there is a singlet at every lattice site, because it's completely filled, then the system is, is kind of robust. Uh, I mean, it's not topologically protected, but it's, 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 it's an insulator, so it's robust. But of course, <laughs> I mean, what I'm telling you is a very simplified model of this very complicated phase diagram, um, where I, I'm just telling you uh, the very simple physics that happens in this, re this regime. Um, uh, these are these parts where no one understands what is going on. That, that, that's more complicated, yes. But uh, they seem that there could be some topological non-trivial phases in this part. Mm -hmm. um, let me just briefly mention uh, the physics here in this antiferromagnetic regime, what is called RKKY interactions. That is that this is the opposite regime. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, so the, 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 the point is that this, I mean, the, the exchange term, it, it's not that it's, it's, cha it's changing the G to the E, but I'm, I'm just writing here, it's just the dispersion relation. Yes, this is I just the... Mm -hmm. here, if you feel the benefit, that some uh, atoms are G and some atoms 
Yes, so I'm trying to simplify a lot the model. So here, the, this is an interaction term. Yes, and the interaction term is going to be an hybridization. So this Hamiltonian has C dagger F, C E, up, down, or ground and excited, maybe in our terms, C E, C G, down, up. So this is what is called the, the, um, this, the uh, there is a term, I mean, there are two terms that contribute, this part and then this other term, C E daga C G, uh, up, down. This is called the, the hybridization parameter B. So you destroy a particle in G and create it in E. Yes, so do you do yeah, kind of, the, the, this, this, yes, this term does that. Mm -hmm. okay. So you, you can see, I mean, this term, uh, as I said, is this, this term called from the exchange interaction that has this term E up, E down, for example, e, this is up, down, and this is down, up. This is the term that happens here at a given lattice size. This is sum over at, at, at a lattice size i. Yes? So you have a term, if you pair them, you are going to have the term here this uh, pair with uh, this, I mean, you can pair this, this type of terms here, or you can pair this, I mean, you can see there is a creation operator and a nucleation operator here. And then, well, and then there is the possibility of have some type of superconductivity that when you pair these two here. So you, you can use both as the order parameter, and you can try to do a, a, a minimization of the energy. This is kind of a mean field theory. But th that's the basic idea, that the basic idea is that you hybridize the ground and with the excited state. You are coupling them by, by, by the interaction Hamiltonian. And that's what you can have something that, that uh, breaks the avoided crossing into, the crossing into avoided crossing. Yeah, my problem was more than, uh, I didn't see why this coupling was actually coupling ENG. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you a very toy simplification of, of the physics there. But I mean, this is the physics behind the heavy fermions. Uh, um, and, and that's what people, um, I mean, do at, at the mean, I mean, you do a mean field uh, minimization of the energy and that's kind of what give you the lowest energy state. Mm -hmm. And also a very, very to toy and simplified cartoon of the other part of the, of the phase diagram here the RKKY interaction, very simplified, very simplified picture. Is that, is, is in the other regime when the tunneling is much larger than the interaction in, in this regime, in this regime here. Mm -hmm. So if you have tunneling much larger than interactions, mm -hmm. so imagine, uh, this is a, I'm going to imagine that you have a box. I mean, am I going to start filling my box with particles? Yes, this is momentum space. I mean, this is different st states. And I'm going to form pairs. I'm going to look. Th this is, of course, these are the conduction, the conduction, the conduction band. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to fill it. I'm going to have a Fermi liquid that is going to be something like this. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I have on the bottom, in this is position state, I have my particles, these are my localized magnetic moments, these are my F particles that are here, localized. So it's, it's a very, they, they can have some spin, I don't know, doesn't have to be antiferromagnetic, eh, eh, some spin configuration. But the, the idea is that these particles, this is in position space, they are localized. And these energy levels are in momentum space. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I mean, this particle is kind of, because in momentum space is delocalized with some momentum at the Fermi, at the Fermi energy. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that this particle can interact, th these two, and uh, I mean, it's delocalized, but it has the probability to be at, uh, to interact with a particle in this, in this, of these localized moments at a given lattice size and then flip-flop the spin. So for example, this, this is up, mm -hmm. then, and this is, uh, this is up, uh, up and this is down, for example. This is where you can have. Mm -hmm. 
So this particle can have an, an interaction with these other particles and flip the spin. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but in order to flip the spin, this particle, of course, has to be promoted to, I mean, this state, you cannot have two up in the same um, internal state. So this has to be flipped to a higher energy state. So as a function of the proper, for this flip the spin, but this has to be promoted to a higher orbital. And this is proportional to J, yes? And it costs a lot of energy. So in this case, the perturbation theory is different. But the, the weak part is the B exchange that generated the flip-flops. And then it's inversely proportional to the tunneling because you are having to promote one particle to a higher orbital. That costs energy uh, interaction, a single particle energy J. So, but because this particle is delocalized, yes? So it's in a higher, it's momentum state. This particle can also interact with another particle that is localized far away. So this is a particle in I, this is a particle in J. And as a function of the, the particle is delocalized, so it can interact with the particle in J and flip again the spin. So this is what's up, then this can, after the interaction with this particle, then this particle come down again. So this is the initial state, virtual state, when this particle is promoted to a higher momentum, it then interact with the other particle and goes down. And then as a function, but flips the spin if this, for example, if this one up and this one down at the beginning, uh, as a function of the process, you can flip the spin of these two particles. So the idea is that this can generate long range interactions between the localized moments. So you have something that is proportional to SI, SJ. This is interaction between the just the localized um, atoms, this is the atoms, that can be long range. You, I mean, in principle, you have some matrix element that is ij. And in principle, it can be one over r cube. I mean, you can do the calculations, and for three dimensions, these matrix elements can decay as one over i minus j, the distance of the particles to the cube. So this is a type of interaction, spin exchange interactions that are mediated by the delocalized uh, conduction electrons. That's what they call, oh, what happened? Um, that is what is called RKKY interaction. So there is a competition between the two. And in principle, these are things that we should be able to see in, 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 in these systems. Mm -hmm. So, OK. So I hope that I can summarize all the. Uh -huh. Sorry, one question. In terms of time scales, what about the localized particles? Do they, do they, so these are kind of just instantaneous because. No, no. I mean, it's going to, I mean, it's. It's, it's going to, I mean, that, that's kind of the, it's kind of, uh, it, well, it's instant, I mean, these particles are delocalized. So in, in some rain, I mean, it's second order perturbation theory. It's the, but uh, the, we take advantage of these delocalized particles can mediate the spin flips between the localized particles because the others are delocalized. But it costs energy. All right, um, now let's see what happened. OK. So just to summarize, in principle, there is a great possibilities that we can, of great physics, that in principle, we can open up and simulate with SUM particles in a lattice. Mm -hmm. So. Um, with that, uh, let me go back and in the last uh, 15 minutes, uh, I'm going to, I mean, I talk about orbital degrees of freedom, the inter interplay between a spin and orbital degrees of freedom, but I have not talked about the, cha the, the possibility to, to generate an effective char de degrees of freedom or try to make the particles um, act as if they were charged particles. In, in other words, trying to implement some type of a spin orbit coupling that happens for, char for the charged electrons. So the basic idea is that, um, well, this is some of the work that we have done on spin orbit coupling in the lattice. So a spin orbit coupling, of course, is a relativistic effect. But uh, we, you most likely you have here that this um, is the coupling between the electron motion and its spin. It's a relativistic effect. And it's at the heart of spintronic devices, topological insulators. 
in principle, is belief that if you have a superconductor uh, and a spin orbit coupling, I mean, a, a system that has a spin orbit coupling in the proximity of a superconductor, in principle, this can generate Majorana particles. And this is one of the directions that, for example, companies like Microsoft is trying to explore to create topological quantum computers. So the generation of a spin orbit coupling can be a very important step in quantum simulation. Um, in general, of course, uh, there has been a great effort trying to generate uh, a spin orbit coupling in, in, in atomic gases. Um, there has been a lot of uh, different experiments uh, using rubidium, potassium, lithium, dysprosium, ytterbium. But um, one of the uh, issues that that for mainly, I mean, for example, rubidium alkaline and atoms experiments have is that in general there has been some heating effects from the Raman transitions that they use, and these heating effects has made the observation of the interplay between a spin orbit coupling and interactions very complicated. So the fact in this case that we have for alkaline atoms a system when you have um, the ground and the excited state. Um, in, in, in this case, that and the excited state is very long lived. Uh -huh. the, the, the spontaneous emission is highly reduced. Then might offer great opportunities for the in generation, for generation of a spin orbit coupling in, our, in, in, in this system. So heating can be no, uh, su substantially um, um, uh, play a much less role than in alkali atoms. And the advantage is that in the optical lattice clocks. A spin orbit coupling is generated very naturally. You don't have to do anything except to decrease the lattice depth of our system. And let me try to explain why is that. So in the case of the atomic clock, we have the ground and excited state, and this is an optical transition. So what happens is that when the laser so we have a laser that has omega e to the kx. k is associated with the momentum, wa momentum wave number of the laser. And so it happens that k comes and, and is large for optical transitions. So in contrast to microwave, for example, k's time a, when a is the lattice spacing, can be significant. So for example, in, in the case of strontium, when we are using the clock laser, the, the clock transition, and we are using A, the lattice spacing for the magic wave lattice. This number can be as large as 7 pi divided by 6. So it's a non trivial number. This doesn't happen, for example, you have microwave transition that is much more smaller. So, what is the advantage here? That if I have a system and I visualize this is a, a, the, the case of a 1D lattice, and I have this is my ground state atoms, this is my excited state atoms, and these atoms are coupled by the clock because I can go and observe a photon from ground and excited state. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, along this real lattice, I can make my particle tunnel. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that as a point, uh, I can, because the phase, I mean, Ka uh, changes, I mean, if I have E to the Kx, Ka can ch change significantly from one lattice size to the next then I can effectively impart a very large flux in my system and generate an effective, kind of an effective magnetic field. So this is the idea. So if I have a laser that couples the ground to excited state, it has this phase E to the AKX, yes? So AKX, um, if I have E to the AK, um, I mean, let's start at position zero. Then I have if uh, phi is k times a, that is lambda lattice divided by lambda, the, the wavelength of the clock laser, that it can change for phi to phi, three phi, and so forth. It changes from one lattice side to the next. So what happens is that if I have a particle and 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 then uh, what I do the process is that um, I have an, a particle that goes from here to here because I observe a photon. Then it has, well, let's do the reference, there is no flux, there is no phase that accumulate here. Then I go from here to here and I do a tunneling process so I'm not accumulating any, any phase. But now I go from here to here because I emit, I mean from the laser I can emit a photon and go from excited to ground state. And then I can tunnel back, I'm doing a closed loop here, 
but as a f because the phase here phi is different from the phase phi here that is zero, as I do a loop, I am going to accumulate a flux phi that is non-trivial during the tunneling process. So this can happen naturally with just allowing the, uh, the atoms in the clock to tunnel. From, from, uh, before, I mean, if we have a very deep lattice and then there the tunneling was suppressed uh, because we wanted to avoid atoms talking between the different sides. So this kind of implements very naturally a two-leg flux ladder. The other picture that I like more uh, and that connects a little bit with more with the spin orbit coupling is the following. If you have um, the Hamiltonian when the particles, the ground and the excited states are tunneling, uh, and then I, I have each one has a, and each one feels the same lattice potential. The, uh, the form of the energy spectrum is uh, like a cosinusoidal potential. Yes, it's 2j uh, cos k. This is the quasi momentum or q, and this is the energy. I might have a slightly different energy between the ground and excited because of, of the, the tuning of the laser. This is the rotating frame. But the point is that if I'm going to have the laser that is going to promote a particle with momentum um, from the ground to the excited state, the laser has some uh, momentum k from the, I mean, I, it, the atom is going to absorb a momentum going from here to here. Um, so there is kind of a, a momentum has to be conserved, so I'm going to couple a state that goes from this state to, to this state. So, but what I can do is that I can do a gauge transformation where I just displace the, the dispersion relation of my excited particles, but I just add the phase here. This phase here is k times a, this phase. So basically, in this gauge frame, I have a particle that goes from the ground to the excited state in a diagonal way. But you can see that the dispersion relation between the two particles is different. So a spin up and down has different dispersion relation because they are shifted. I mean, this is just a transformation that I make. And now, if you have a, this system because it's diagonal, I can model the system just as a bunch of a spin, one half particles. I mean, the laser is coupling this with this. Mm -hmm. and, but the, the tuning the, of the system, now you can see that it's going to depend on the quasi momentum. So the energy splitting between the up and the down state is going to change as a function of quasi-momentum. So I have, therefore, an effective magnetic field that is generated from the laser that has, um, along the x direction, is I mean, omega, because I'm coupling ground to excited state along the x direction. But then I also have a detuning that is the energy difference between this particle and this other particle. So it creates an um, effective um, um, a, 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 a spin motional coupling because now the, the, the effective magnetic field that determines my, the, the, the orientation at which my spins point now is going to change depending on the momentum. So basically, if I have um, my system, then um, um, I mean these are the bare bands, and when I I I I, I try the dress states are going to couple them in a non-trivial way. So um, so basically, what I have is that if you look at the uh, and the the system that has um, effective magnetic field that has some the ma magnitude omega uh, along the x direction, but it has an energy that depends on the tuning that depends on the momentum along the c direction, then what happens is that the system is going to, uh, depending on the momentum, the ground, the eigenstate of the system are going to point along the different directions of the block sphere that are going to depend, the term, depend on the momentum of the particle. So each, um, at, at single particle states, you have a, a bunch of spins that has um, what we call a, a spin motional locking, depending on the, on, the, on the momentum that they have, they, or they point along the different directions. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Or not necessary? Yes? No? no not quite? Um, any, any question about that? Uh -huh. uh, by doing this, the, the transition energy is always diagonal. Uh -huh. So now, if you shift it, the transition energy 
transition point happens in a different case. Yes. So this is exactly what I mean, I do a case transformation where basically I replace um, C, uh, I mean, I have um, the creation operator CE, and then I'm going to add a phase E to the I, E I phi. If this is a position, I mean, in position, if this is this, this is, I'm going to change it by a phase. Only. I mean, these are uh, now is a bunch of uh, spins that are really a couple um, from ground to, I mean, they are decoupled, or, or, or maybe I relabel the k of the excited state by k plus phi. Yes? So now my laser are coupling, is coupling this state with this state. So I, I have a, my system becomes just a diagonal. I mean, for e, I mean now the eigenstates are a given momentum k can be a superposition of this ground k and excited k. And I have a bunch of uh, spins with this, uh, with this uh, type of, that are described by just the Hamiltonian that has a the tuning that depends on q or the mo momentum and, and the rabbit drive. Yes? So now, if, I mean, I have a, if I populate my system with fermions, then for each uh, momentum k, I have just a two-level system that I can solve in a very simple term. The, ch the k it then is going to be determined by the temperature of my system. For example, if I have an initial, I mean, the, the population, and I have a fermionic si atoms, so if I have a unit filling, I'm going to populate all the different momentum k. If I have a, a very small, this is going to be the filling of my particles. So, for example, I prepare all the atoms in the ground state, then they are going to populate all the states in the band of two certain k. This is the population of the k. Yes, but this phase is determined by the, the, the wavelength of the laser times A. This is the phase that I'm imposing to the system. So I have an atom. I'm going from the ground to the excited state. I'm absorbing a photon. And then what happens is that I go from here to here. I mean, I'm ch I have to conserve momentum. So I have an atom absorb a photon with certain momentum. And I go from ground to excited state and accumulate some momentum that is K times A. Mm -hmm. That, that's, that's, uh, this is set by the lattice uh, uh, spacing and the wavelength of the laser, this phi. So in the case of a strontium, this phi is fixed. For example, it's 7 pi divided by 6. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does that make sense now? Yes? So basically, I have a system where um, I can have, a, a, a depending on the momentum of my fermions, I'm going to point along different directions. The eigenstates are going to point along different directions. So, um, and uh, this is kind of the experiment that, that we are going to, to do. I mean, um, so I have, a, so I have, there, um, there are three, um, you, I have the ground band and I have the excited band. Mm -hmm. And then depending, I mean, I'm, I have already shifted my excited band uh, with this phi of the laser. So the coupling is now diagonal. And then I can have a global parameter that is going to tell me where my bands cross. So if the, the tuning is zero, I have no, a crossing at this point. At this momentum, if I have a larger the tuning, I'm going to cross at a different momentum. But if I have a very large the tunnels, my bands are never going to cross. So basically, the experiment that we did is that we start with all the atoms populated in the ground state, in the ground band. This is the blue band. And then we apply, apply a laser, and I'm going to be able to transfer population from the ground to the excited state when the, whenever the bands cross. But at some point, um, because I mean, uh, they're they are going to cross, 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 and at some point, they're going to be not cross anymore. And it, at this part, I open a gap, and I'm no longer going to be able to transfer population between the ground and the excited state. So that's the experiment. So th this is the, the tuning of the laser. And then we can actually, um, um, the, the region of the tunings, when I can transfer population to the ground, to the excited state, is determined by the curvature of the band, the tunneling, and the spin orbit coupling angle. So if, they, if where I didn't have, if five were zero, it, and the bands were one on top of each other, I would uh, stop transferring at very small, I mean, all, uh, when I start to increase the tuning, the bands stop overlapping. So if I don't have a spin orbit coupling, 
and I have my bands one on top of each other. Then when I, as soon as I start to detune, they are not going to touch. But because they are displaced by phi, they are going to couple and they are going to touch to each other until I, at, after at some point where I uh, stop cross, I stop crossing, and then there is a point when they are just barely touched. And this is called a Van Hoff singularity. At this point, um, is, is I have a um, divergence of the density of a state, and I, uh, the, the population, the transfer is maximum, and then I stop transferring. That, that's the prediction from, from the theory single particle Hamiltonian. And um, this is exactly what the experiment saw. So they have the atoms populated in the ground state, apply a laser, and then uh, lay count the population on the excited state. And you can see that depen depending on the lattice depth, uh, depending on the tunneling, if the tunneling is very small, there is just almost a single peak. But as I start to change the, 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 the depth of my lattice potential, I start to see these by Hopf singularities that were predicted from the theory. So that, that's when the first observation of spin orbit coupling, and I can look at the width of this, and I can actually reproduce that the width is proportional to the tunneling. And that's what we have here, the width of the spin orbit coupling. And finally, um, uh, maybe, well, we, w we can go to higher bands, and, and that's it. But maybe to conclude, uh, the last experiments that we try to uh, implement to see a spin orbit coupling is now we do the same experiment, but we apply a very, very uh, small uh, Rabi frequency, such that I only going to be transfer the atoms when they are almost touching, the two bands are touching. For example, in this case, I can only transfer the atoms in a very region, a small region where the, the, they are all, where the tuning is very small, and then I can blow out away the atoms that are in that were not transferred to the excited state. So in that way, I have a used spin orbit coupling to have a selection of the momentum states that I can transfer because you can see depending on where they cross, I'm going to select a set of momentum, but, uh, atoms in the specific quasi-momentum. For example, in this case, I'm going to select the atoms in a given quasi-momentum for the, the, the tuning that I apply. So, so the idea is that depend if I, if I change the, the tuning, I'm going to change the position at which the bands are going to cross, and I'm going to be able to select different parts of quasi-momentum. So what I did is that then, um, we select these atoms at a given quasi-momentum. I transfer some atoms in the excited state with given quasi-momentum. But as I mentioned, depending on the quasi-momentum, the eigenstates of the system point along the different directions. So they are going to experience different Rabi frequencies. So basically, I start with all the atoms in the excited state, but depending on the quasi-momentum, they are going to have different Rabi fropping that depends on the quasi-momentum I transfer. And that's exactly what we observe in the experiment that we have. Um, depend, uh, you can see that uh, depending of the window of quasi-momentum that I choose, the Rabi oscillations as a function of time is going to be very different. And that is showing the existence of a spin orbit coupling in my system. Yes? So basically what I said is that in, uh, by using the, the face of the laser, we can implement a spin orbit coupled system and this gives me the opportunity to start explore very interesting physics ahead. So um, I think I'm running out of time. So I just perhaps want to finish and uh, saying that there is a uh, sorry, there is a very rich uh, physics ahead. And with all this lecture, I hope that I I can I am there is a great vista ahead with alkaline atoms. We uh, study a little bit of P wave magnetism. We, I told you a little bit of SUN physics. I tell you a little bit of condo lattice models, uh, spin orbital coupling. But there is a rich type of different uh, quantum simulations that we can do with alkaline atoms. And we hope that um, uh, we can continue making progress and use these systems as a real uh, simulator of SUN systems. Any questions? Does it make sense to look for spin orbit coupling using like spin dependent or uh, light sheets of state dependent lattices and stuff like this? Like, I mean, you can try to use, for example, a, a, a spin orbit coupling using Raman beams. Okay. 
instead, instead of using the ground and excited state, we can use just Raman beams that transfer momentum between different gr uh, ground state at nuclear spin states. So this is one way that we can we can do. But definitely, I mean, if you can engineer a lattice that is different from the ground to excited state, it's not going to be controlled by a flux, but uh, still we are going to have a different band dispersion from the ground and excited state. So yes, the in, in some degree, yes. It's not, yes, exactly. We are not having a micro, a uh, hyperfine states. Yes. Uh, so we are not having uh, states that are split by gigahertz energy. There is an optical transition. And that's why uh, introducing the, um, the K vector that I gain by going from the ground to the excited states is large enough that K times A is a large number. So just by directly interrogating the transition, I can transfer a significant momentum. Mm -hmm. We have to stop. Yes, yes. Sorry. Huh?